Hi, everybody. I'm Sheila Pluzzi. I am the co-director of Mental Health Foundations and also co-owner of The Healing Loft. And I'm <clears throat> feeling very grateful to have everybody joining this evening. Um, I think for a much needed, I guess, reflection on our fear these days and how to feel through the fear, through the fear. Uh, so I'm going to give a little bit of time for people to get logged on um, before I start with the presentation. But what I might, I guess, just express while we're waiting for people to join uh, is my deep gratitude for everyone that is logging on. Uh, there was a lot of interest and people reaching out. And I do feel, you know, with all of the social distancing, um, this webinar was kind of in my heart as a way to be able to feel connected to other people and to all of you, um, as well as to, I guess, support uh, people who may be struggling. I have had several people reach out um, with increased stress and anxiety and kind of unsure how to navigate these times. Um, so I can certainly relate as well to the, the increased fear and uncertainty and uh, I've been doing a lot of personal work to uh, try to feel through the fear myself. So this evening uh, will be about an hour um, as a way to, there'll be a little bit of education just about fear itself. And then I also wanted to set this up so it could be um, very experiential. And the format uh, is a little bit different than I normally do. So I do apologize. Normally there's a, a question and answer. Um, button at the bottom of your screen uh, because I set it up as a meeting that option uh, isn't available so I do apologize about that but encourage you to reach out uh, to me either through mental health foundations or uh, the healing loft on our social media Instagram Facebook or uh, or myself personally <clears throat> pardon me and my email uh, is Sheila Pluzzi s-h-e-i-l-a-p-a-l U Z Z I eight 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 at gmail.com. And so I see we have quite a few participants this evening. So I am going to get started uh, on the presentation. So I'll be I'll be sharing my screen um, just so that it might be easier to have a visual and follow along. So feeling through the fear, uh, I also want to let people know uh, this is being recorded. So that's why I also um, turned your audio off just to protect privacy and confidentiality and so that I can make this video available to the public for those who weren't able to join this evening. Okay, so let's start with why the fear. Um, you know, I've had various, I guess, responses personally, but also from other people um, questioning, you know, should they be afraid? How afraid should we be? Um, you know, other people trying to push down the fear, try to deny it. And so where I wanted to start is just to discuss the biology of fear. And fear is one of the basic emotions that we are all equipped with. And it keeps us safe. So the function of fear is it's a response to a potential threat and the physiological response that our body has prepares us to respond to that threat. So the common ones are to fight, flight, freeze, or flop. And those are all instinctual survival um, responses to the emotion of fear. So to feel fear isn't a weakness, it isn't a, def or a defect in any of us. Uh, we actually need fear to keep us safe. If we didn't have fear in our systems, you know, we wouldn't maybe look both ways before crossing the road or make sure our seatbelts are on um, or do other things that, that to keep us safe. So this webinar isn't about, you know, how to deny your fear or how to push it away or numb it out. Um, we want to really look at kind of what the fear is telling us now. And one of the other, I guess, facts that kind of impacts our relationship with fear is that we are living in a culture of scarcity. So, um, you know, long before COVID-19 and all the precautionary measures, you know, that are being encouraged, 
we receive fear messages in our culture all the time. If you think about like in a typical day, you know, on social media in real life, we see fears about, you know, how to or not to feed your children, whether to breastfeed or formula feed. Um, don't leave your luggage unattended because someone might slip drugs in there or a bomb. Don't leave your children unattended because someone might steal them. Don't um, eat this. Don't do that. There are fear messages everywhere in our society. So a lot of us, you know, we're pretty maxed out in terms of our stress responses and already feeling that underlying fear quite a bit before COVID-19 even came in, you know, to existence. And so now that it, there is this very, you know, real threat, um, a lot of people are feeling overwhelmed by the degree of fear. And it's not just around the events that are happening recently. It's because of, you know, all those fear messages we've been receiving for so long. And so I just wanted to touch upon that briefly. Um, you know, if, if you're feeling really panicked or overwhelmed and, and not maybe certain why, because um, we live in a culture that really actually celebrates um, keeping people afraid. <laughs> and the other thing is, you know, feel the fear, don't feed the fear. So what we're going to be working through tonight is how to connect to it. Um, and not in a manner again to like make it go away or to deny it, but to really feel through it and get the wisdom of it. And how that's different from feeding the fear is I find, you know, when I stay stuck in my head, I'm usually feeding the fear, you know, the whole like, what if, what if, what if, oh, and then what if, oh my gosh, so what if, you know, what if this scenario happens and then, oh my, and this might happen and this might happen. So that's more feeding the fear, you know, when we stay in our brains and kind of ruminate and, you know, try to plan out for all the what ifs or problem solve everything that can often feed the fear. And so we're working on this evening, feeling it, not feeding it. So just some personal reflection. Uh, I encourage you to take a moment to get a pen or a paper. Um, or you can, if you have your phone in front of you, you can also, you know, open up a notes application and just take some notes, but just to reflect on these questions for yourself. What are you most fearful about? You know, these days, is it getting sick yourself? Is it losing somebody that you love? Is it running out of necessary supplies, whether they be nutritional or medical? Are you afraid of your financial situation? Just what's most alive in terms of your fear today? When is present, when is fear present throughout your day? So if you kind of quickly scan past, you know, the last few days, has it been this underlying kind of niggling fear that's always present? Do you notice, you know, I hear from a lot of clients that it's at bedtime when things are finally quiet, that all the panic and fear thoughts and ruminating kind of gets really intense. Is it in the morning, you know, when you start your day? Just when is fear present throughout your day? What do you tend to do when you are worried? So those would be the behaviors and the actions. Um, I know for myself, I have a tendency to um, start to control or try to control things, uh, like my husband, who isn't always impressed with that. <laughs> um, so that might look like, you know, checking in, you know, did you do this? Did you, oh, make sure you do this, make sure you do this. Um, and it's coming from a really vulnerable place. However, um, it looks uh, and probably feels for him quite irritating and it looks very controlling, right? And that it's about the other person and not necessarily what my internal experience is. Some people panic and maybe get reactive. Um, you know, the, maybe the response, you know, example of that recently is like the response to the toilet paper. You know, people feeling afraid and kind of in that panic going out and buying as much as they possibly could. Uh, but what do you tend to do when you are worried or afraid? And then the last one, what do you tend to say 
when you're worried or afraid? How are you communicating? I know for myself, when I go into the controlling mode, you know, I'm often, instead of saying I feel really scared and kind of vulnerable, I'm, you know, barking orders or, you know, double checking on things that my, my husband take, is, has taken care of, no problem. But it's like, did you sure? Did you do it? How did you do it? Did you make sure you did it this way? So in terms of what I'm saying, it's a lot of questioning and, um, and ordering, really. So just taking a moment to reflect on what you say and how you communicate. And so that everyone knows as well, this personal reflection is not with the intent of judging or shaming or saying how you're doing things wrong. Um, you know, I shared some of the things that I do. I don't have any shame around them. Because if we want to look at shifting, you know, our response to fear, we have to really understand how we're being impacted by it now. And so this is just curiosity, not to answer, um, to judge. So next we're going to look at some of the common ways that we manage fear and worry. There is the ever popular keep it inside and ruminate. Um, I see this a lot, you know, with people who have, um, you know, whether it's diagnosed by a doctor or kind of self-diagnosed, but anxiety, you know, when you're just constantly feeling it and then all the what ifs happen and then that increases the feeling of fear and then that like further intensifies the kind of um, chaotic kind of thinking and the rumination. So keeping it inside and ruminating is a really, really common one. There's also, you know, pushing aside, denying it, trying to block it out. Um, that might be, you know, for some people, they may not be looking at any of the news or following any um, information or reports on the updates for, regarding COVID-19. Um, and again, it's, it's, we don't want to bring judgment to this. It's not a lack of intelligence. It's, you know, sometimes it's a way that we, we deal with fear. We just kind of want to pretend that it's not there and block it out somehow. Numb, this is uh, very popular for our culture, not just with fear, but with all emotions. Excuse me. <coughs> and so, you know, Brene Brown has a wonderful video called The Power of Vulnerability. And she talks about numbing. And one of the things that resonated so powerfully with me, and I noticed it in myself, is she said, we cannot selectively numb. So if I'm numbing out um, my fear with, you know, some of the common culprits, food, alcohol, um, drugs of any sort, whether it be pills, um, marijuana, um, any kind of substance to numb. Some of us, and I know I've been um, guilty of it, I would numb with work, you know, like, kind of like that addiction to being a workaholic. Um, but numbing is any way that we just try to numb out to how we're feeling, scrolling on social media, watching television. Um, the, the difficulty though, is that if we're numbing out the uncomfortable or painful emotions, we're also numbing out joy, happiness, ex excitement, because from you know her research, she found we can't selectively numb. We don't just get to pick which ones we don't feel. So if I'm numbing my emotions, then I notice that I, I do not experience joy as much or happiness or excitement. And so this is a very, very common way um, that our culture actually encourages us to, to cope. Uh, I mean, no judgment with this, but I've seen tons of memes of, you know, people, I think I just read one that it's, I'm for the second time this week, I'm going out and buying out my alcohol for the next two weeks. Um, and there's humor to it. Excuse me. <clears throat> I've certainly used that to numb at times, but it just speaks to how common it is. And with no judgment, I do want to encourage throughout this webinar um, to, to find our way out of the numbing or to like to consciously numb <laughs> or maybe just make a decision to numb a little less. Um, it can be intense to feel it all. 
And so I know throughout these times, um, for the past few weeks, uh, I'm really consciously trying to avoid alcohol, trying to avoid scrolling on social media too much. And it can become really overwhelming um, emotionally at times to not have those things. So I've selected a few things, you know, like at the end of the day, watching a couple fluffy TV shows, um, but consciously making those choices to come. So that is a really common one in our culture. Um, get angry and irritable. This is also a pretty common one. To feel fear uh, is a little bit vulnerable. And so on the surface, what we may see is ourselves, you know, or our partners, maybe getting irritable or frustrated or barking at us or short with us. Um, and that, I believe the anger is kind of a protective mechanism, you know, for the fear. But it can certainly, um, I mean, create some tension in relationship dynamics and also doesn't necessarily feel good either to be kind of irritable and uh, agitated, <clears throat> especially with the ones we love. Here's me, <laughs> try to control things. Um, anytime, you know, that I see in myself or somebody else really controlling behaviors, I've learned to see that fear is underneath almost all the time and to have a lot of compassion for it. Um, so if you are this person or perhaps if you're friends or a partner of someone who really um, tends to be controlling, that uh, they're just at this time specifically, there might be a lot of fear underneath. So it might be worth it to ask them or even ask yourself, you know, what's, What's the fear that's underneath this kind of intense need to control? And panic. So panic is not fear. <laughs> panic is going out and buying 500 rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> um, and I mean, we've seen it a lot happening in our society, in our culture. Um, and understandably, like there is real fear and there is real threat to our health. Uh, but panic is, it's not responding to fear. Panic is just reacting to fear, right? And trying to mitigate it by, you know, whether it's by making sure we have enough supplies to last us a year, um, whether it's, you know, sharing your panic with everybody. Uh, and the one thing with panic is it tends to be quite contagious. Um, hence why most of grocery shelves, store shelves were completely barren. Um, of paper towels, of toilet paper, of hand sanitizer, Lysol wipes, all of those things. Um, so it, it is, if this is your response, not to judge yourself or feel bad about it, but to bring some awareness to it, because uh, we, can, we can impact others with our panic, uh, <clears throat> especially our children too. I know our little guy looks to us for our reactions to things. So I try to be really mindful um, not to get panicky um, in response to, to fear and to what's going on these days. So just take a moment and maybe just write down your top two you know, ways that you manage fear. And then I wanna take a look at the impact. Um, again, to bring awareness, uh, not judgment, but there's a lot of research um, that shows, so if we are kind of in a constant state of stress, um, <coughs> excuse me, or we're worrying or we're panicking a lot, it can create this chronic experience of anxiety and stress. And so when we have chronic, um, actually I'll back up a second. So when fear comes, there's a, a bunch of different reactions that happen in our body. And one of them is that cortisol is released and that helps, you know, our body to prepare and respond to the threat. When we're constantly feeling afraid, that cortisol is, you know, continually being released and that's not biologically, you know, it's, it's function, but we have so much stress these days and there is a lot of fear. And so when our, our, body is experiencing these prolonged and intense bursts of uh, cortisol, it starts to break down our immune system. And so specifically with fear, when we're holding it in, 
um, it can create illness within us um, through immune suppression. And then I put disease, which is a term used by Gabor Mate. And the disease can be emotional, mental, or physical. But the more we try to shove down and push down and suppress our emotions, um, you know, they have to go somewhere. Emotions, emotion is energy in motion. So we might think we've gotten rid of it, um, but it may manifest in chronic headaches. It might manifest in an autoimmune disorder. It may manifest in, you know, depression, which is often the suppression of anger. So I want to bring to light kind of these issues again, so that once we know, we can change. And Gabor Mate has a great book called When the Body Says No. If you do want to learn more about the suppression of emotion and its connection to um, specifically autoimmune disorders and also certain types of cancer. And, and I say connection and correlation, not causation. But there's absolute um, science and research to, to prove um, these theories. So the other impact, feelings of disempowerment and helplessness. So again, especially, you know, the, the ruminating, the what ifs, we can play those what if games all day long. And sometimes it can create this real sense of, of helplessness and, and disempowerment when we kind of stay stuck inside of the fear and like, you know, live there is what I <clears throat> kind of a term I use. And that can be really difficult on us. Uh, it can also be difficult on our relationship dynamics. So whether it be the suppression of it um, and just not sharing, you know, we might be distant with our partners, um, creating a bit of disconnect. If, if our way that we manage it is to be irritable or angry, um, you know, that would certainly not play out well or create tension in the relationship. Uh, I know for myself, uh, when I have my Catrolli pants on, <laughs> um, we've, we've gotten to a place where we can deal with it in a funny way. But before, and he has the same issues, it would create so much of a power struggle because neither of us, <clears throat> excuse me, neither of us want to be told what to do, right? Or be questioned around really simple things. So if you're noticing, you know, in the past few days, if you've been really fearful, and maybe managing in one of the ways that I've just discussed, it may start to be impacting um, your relationship dynamics, especially you know, with the social distancing and spending more time at home. So I hope that this can maybe help you to understand a little bit about um, the ways that we commonly manage, but also the impact kind of in terms of our daily lives. So what is the problem? If fear is natural and we need it, um, and yet our culture celebrates not feeling it <laughs> in many different ways. What's the problem? The problem is how we hold the fear. <clears throat> it's not that we actually have fear. And so one thing that I've been practicing a lot personally um, and with clients as well is learning to drop down from our heads to our hearts. A lot of us, and, and I think, you know, it's a Western culture thing, you know, we live from the neck up and believe that all the answers, you know, we can intellectualize things and figure them out from an intellectual point of view, but our bodies are much wiser than our minds. And so as we go through this webinar, we're going to learn how to actually sink in to our hearts and feel through in our bodies and feel through the fear as opposed to, you know, kind of being disconnected and just trying to figure it out up here. So we're just going to hold it in a different way. So here uh, are the steps in terms of the solution to feel our way through. I'm going to review them and then I'm going to unpack each one and speak a little bit more in detail in terms of what that looks like, because at the end, we're going to culminate them all together and I'm going to guide you through an experiential. So the first step is to recognize it in our body without judgment. And although that can sound really simple, when we live really busy lives and, you know, we're always trying to stay ahead, <laughs> what's next and making sure the checklists are checked off, we're not always aware of paying attention to what's happening in our body. So the first step to feeling, the way feeling our way through is noticing 
you know, what does fear feel like in my body? Where does it resonate? You know, is it tension in my shoulders? Is it, you know, my heart feeling kind of constricted? Is it my breath maybe feeling um, tight and maybe a little more difficult? But just bringing that recognition um, but where we feel it in our body. Second step is to bring awareness to the fear and the worry. So once, you know, we're able to connect to you, oh, you know, I feel fear. Maybe it's in kind of your solar plexus or your stomach. <clears throat> the bringing awareness to it is just bringing our hands and putting our hands, you know, on our body wherever we may be feeling that fear. And what that helps us to do is not only is it a nurturing thing, you know, that says, yep, I'm coming in, I'm going to be with this for a moment. Uh, it also helps to draw our attention, you know, instead of our mind trying to take us away from it, we're going to choose to, you know, bring the focus and the attention to that place, wherever it is. The third one is be still and know. This one um, can take a little bit more time to cultivate, <clears throat> excuse me, especially if you don't have uh, experience with meditation or or mindfulness practices, or just being kind of quiet within yourself. Um, but we will be, you know, um, I will be guiding you through this in the experiential and unpacking a little bit more. But the be still and know is just literally being still and going inside and tapping into that inner wisdom that we all have. And the last step <clears throat> is transforming it with trust. And that I'll go into a little bit more detail, but the transforming it with trust isn't just about, I'm going to get rid of the fear and just trust. It's just a different way, to, again, to hold the fear that can bring a bit of a different energy to it, where, you know, fear would be like, oh my God, what if, uh, what if I get sick? And um, what if I get sick and die? <clears throat> that might be on some people's minds. Bringing the trust in is being, you know, would be saying, I trust that I can handle it if I get sick and die. So we're not denying the fear. We're not trying to, you know, put any silver lining around it. We're not trying to, feel, you know, feel our way out of it. It's just bringing in the trust that whatever happens, we will handle it. So let's start unpacking. <clears throat> I'm gonna encourage you to you know go to yourself use yourself as the reference so where do you feel fear in your body so just take a moment if you need to close your eyes that can often help us to you know really connect to what's going on in there um, i also encourage you know connecting to our body like just even looking down um, can help bring us into our body as opposed to looking up which usually engages our intellect so just to look down, close your eyes if necessary, and just start to tune in to where you're feeling any fear or worry in your body. And then starting to describe to yourself what it actually feels like, the sensations. You know, is it tight? Is it constricted? Is it heavy? Is it cold? Is it vibrating? Is it chaotic? Like just whatever descriptive words fit for you. And then the last two points here are just not about judging, right? Like, oh, I shouldn't be afraid of this, or oh my goodness, I shouldn't feel fear this much. <clears throat> in this step, you're just simply noticing and observing what is happening in your body and describing what it feels like for you. And the more that we do this, the easier it will be to recognize, you know, when fear is present within us. Because I know sometimes, you know, when I have gone through periods of like numbing, right, a lot, sometimes I'll ask myself how I feel and I'm not even quite, like it takes me a lot longer to sink down and actually connect with how I'm feeling. So the more that we can practice this step, you know, the easier it'll be to recognize what we're feeling and when we're feeling it. So bringing awareness to the fear, 
I talked about this, bringing your hands, you know, to wherever on your body you're feeling it most alive, or it might be two places. <clears throat> in my meditation the other day, I felt it in my head and my heart. And with this step, we're just being with it. And I also encourage, you know, to invite deep breaths into this process, not for the purpose of getting rid of the fear, um, but for two reasons. One, you know, a deep breath can help to calm our nervous system. Because sometimes when we first go into our bodies and connect with how we feel, there can be this initial spike, right, of fear, like, holy crap, like, whew, there it is. Oh my God, this is overwhelming. I might never be able to handle it. You know, our brain starts telling us stories about what's happening. The breath is just a way to like, let the body know it's okay. It's safe. I'm going to be with this fear. And that's okay. And then the other part about the breath is kind of just bringing awareness and consciousness into our body. And it can create a bit of space for us to feel what's going on in there. So depending on how intense your, your experience of connecting with the fear is, you may take two deep breaths, but if, if it's really, really intense, you might take, need to take 10 breaths just to, you know, go from that state of maybe feeling overwhelmed or panicked to just being able to, to be with and sit with the fear. And one of the, um, I guess, my favorite breaths when using meditation is called the cleansing breath. And it's just inhaling through the nose for three, two, one, and exhaling through the mouth for three, two, and one. And so that longer exhale can help us get into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is more the rest and repair. And then the other benefit of breathing and deep breathing is, you know, when we're afraid for a long period of time or undergoing a lot of stress and worry and concern, we are often not breathing, um, you know, it's often very shallow in our chest or sometimes we're even holding our breath for prolonged periods of time without even knowing. So just connecting with the breath, whew, just kind of creates some space in the body and reassures the body that it's okay. So step three, be still and know. This is the one that I was saying sometimes can take a little bit uh, longer to cultivate, which is certainly possible. So this is about being curious about what your fear is teaching you. you know, we, we learned in the beginning that fear is a biological response to a threat. And this part is just, you know, going to that inner wisdom and asking, you know, what is this about? What is this trying to teach me? And an example that I've had recently with this process is <clears throat> I woke up the other morning uh, feeling really irritable and I couldn't figure out why. Like there was no logical reason. I had had a lovely day, you know, the day before, a lovely evening, a great sleep. And I just woke up with this feeling of like my heart was really tense and I felt kind of like, I don't know, I just felt bitchy is the only word that's coming to mind, like cranky, um, and just agitated. And so in my morning meditation, I, you know, brought my hands there because that's where I was feeling at the strongest and took some breaths and just started asking, like, what is this about? And after a few minutes, you know, I'm just breathing and being with it. What was revealed to me is you know, underneath the agitation was actually this very, very vulnerable fear. Um, and so went from agitation to afraid of money. And then when I sat with that and was curious about that, um, you know, the wisdom that was revealed to me was that I've had a long uh, pattern of believing that my value as a human being equates to how much money I'm making. And so, you know, with all of the, you know, with <clears throat> the recent events, there's been trainings that needed to be postponed. Income has, you know, significantly uh, shifted and decreased. 
And so at the very bottom of that fear was, you know, if I'm not making as much money, I, I won't be loved the same or valued the same by my family. And so that was my be still and no. And once I got to that knowing, it was much easier for me to recognize what I needed, which was just compassion and this reassurance. You know, I shared it with my husband and he reassured me that that's not, you know, my value is not about how much money I bring in. Um, and so it just really being able to be still and know really impacted how I acted throughout the rest of my day. Because if I would have just went on that irritability, I probably would have been short with my husband. I probably would have, you know, been kind of cranky and uptight and, you know, just agitated all day long. So the be still and no can often give us some really deep wisdom about ourselves and, and also kind of guide our next steps in terms of action in a day. So in there too is the stance of compassion over judgment. It's not about assessing whether you're right or wrong for feeling that way. Um, it's just inviting like just a lot of curiosity and compassion into the emotion. Uh, what is it trying to tell me? What is this about for me? Uh, when we can be still and know, it can provide us insights and teachings as to how to consciously respond to, to the fear as opposed to unconsciously reacting. So again, in my example, you know, it would be waking up irritated and just going with it and possibly, you know, getting into an argument with my husband or feeling really bad because at the end of the day, because I was so cranky and irritable or, you know, to sit with it and really get to know it and understand what was coming up and share it with my husband and have this really beautiful conversation and get the reassurance that I was needing. So even though sometimes it can take longer to cultivate this be still and knowing, to me, it's so integral to, you know, how we, I guess how we feel and interact with ourselves, but also how we feel and interact with the world. Um, so I've mentioned it, it may take some time. And, and the reason why is, again, it's a lot of the time we're used to living, you know, from the neck up. And so a lot of people, myself included, when they start with this, you know, being still and connecting and being curious, the mind wants to come in and like make sense of things or say, no, no, that's wrong. This is what's really happening. <laughs> and so it can take a little while, you know, to kind of quiet the mind, settle back into the body. And sometimes, you know, and even like a five minute meditation, you might be doing that, you know, 25 times where it's like, no. I'm going to bring my attention back, you know, into the feeling. And that's why holding the space can be helpful too, because it helps us keep connected and anchored to what we want to focus on. Um, and again, out of our heads and into our hearts for the knowing. Most wisdom um, comes from our body, our intuition, you know, whatever word you want to connect to it, um, over our intellect. And developing trust. So one solution to diminishing fear is develop more trust in your ability to handle whatever comes your way, no matter how scary. And, you know, my example with this, using that same meditation, um, the fear was saying, you know, you're not making enough money and your husband's going to leave you. And my first reaction was to want to like stop meditating and get out of that and like distract myself. And so that was the moment when I brought in the trust and I just stayed with the fear and took some breaths. And I said, I trust I can handle it if he leaves me. And I know that's not going to happen. And, you know, we talked about it afterwards, but that is a way that you can invite trust into those experiences. That even the, the crazy what ifs that play out, I trust that I can handle it. And the biggest superpower, oh, sorry. Um, it can be done using a mantra. So I, you know, I trust I can handle this, dot, 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 whatever it is. This last one, um, so if you're not, like if you don't have a spiritual connection or religious belief, I don't want you to feel as though I'm pushing this on you um, and feel free to, you know, just disconnect from this part of the webinar um, or just listen, you know, from your own stance or opinion. 
One thing that I have absolutely come to learn is that the superpower of trust is developing spiritual or religious trust that all is unfolding as it needs to in order to support your life path. And so whether you believe in, you know, energy or karma or the creator, mother earth, source, Allah, God, um, to anchor into, you know, that trust that all is unfolding as it needs to. And that doesn't mean that it's going to unfold the way we want it or the way we would like it. You know, I don't think there's anybody here that, you know, would want people to be dying and, and getting sick. You know, it's, it's having that higher, that trust that there's a bigger picture that we're not privy to, you know, and down on this earth and our little beings. Um, but that can create a lot of comfort um, during really scary times, any connection to faith um, or spirituality and just trusting that it's happening as it needs to. Okay, so the first part of our experiential, I want you to write down, you can do one or three, but try to definitely do one. I fear that, and fill in the blank. I fear that um, I will lose somebody that I love. I fear that, um, you know, we're gonna struggle financially. I fear that I may not have my job to return to. I fear that I might get laid off. <clears throat> Whatever fear is most alive for you right now. So I want you to, we're just gonna do one, if that's okay, for the sake of time, but you can do this exercise after. So now what I want you to do is scratch out the word fear and instead replace it with the phrase, I trust I can handle it if. So the example is, I fear I will get sick. I trust I can handle it if I get sick. And so you can see that they have two very different energies to it. You know, but the putting the trust in doesn't deny that the fear is there. It, it acknowledges the fear with respect. And it just invites that element of trust in that even if, you know, the worst possibly could happen, I trust that I'll be able to handle it. Okay, so we're going to go through the experiential. Um, and we're going to put all those steps together. So what I'm going to encourage you to do, which might seem counterintuitive, but I want you to think about, you know, if the fear isn't present in your body right now, I do want you to think or bring to mind, um, you know, what that fear is. So it might've been from that last slide we did, or it might've been when you did the personal reflection on fear. But just what is it that you're currently really worried about or fearful of? And I want you to just let that bubble up in your body. And so for the next few steps, I'm actually gonna put them all on the screen. And you can take a screenshot of this if you want, because um, for the next few steps, I'm going to be inviting you to close your eyes. Uh, I will be closing my eyes as well, just so we can really, really work through it. Um, so feel free if you want to take a screenshot right now, and then we'll get into it. Okay. So at this time, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, or even just downcast right into, you know, down into your body. And I want you either out loud or in your mind, begin to describe how you're experiencing the fear in your body. And if you need to do kind of a quick scan from head to toe, if it's not clear or you're not aware immediately, 
You start at the crown of your head and just slowly scan down and observe for experience of fear or worry. Scanning down your face and neck, your shoulders and arms, your chest and torso, down past your hips, thighs, down your knees into your calves and shins and down to your feet. Again, just observing and describing what the fear feels like in your body. And you may notice it in several different places. So I invite you now to place your hands either where it feels most strong or in the two spots, you know, one hand on each spot where you feel it the most. And we're gonna start taking some deep breaths in through the nose for three, two, one, out through the mouth for three, two, one, again, inhale, three, two, one, exhale, four, three, two, one, and again, in, exhale, just being with the fear for this present moment. And exhale. And taking one last deep breath in for three, two, one. Exhale for three, two, one. And now for the next little bit, I'm going to allow some silence to really practice the be still and know. So you may ask your fear, you know, what, what are you here to teach me? What do I need to know? And try to receive the answer from that place wherever you're in contact with it as opposed to thinking it in your mind or trying to find the answer in your mind. And if at any time, you know, you notice you're in your head, do not judge it, just bring your awareness to it and then make the choice to connect back to your body and back to the fear. And you take a few deep breaths just answer the questions again, or ask the questions again. What is my fear here to teach me about? And so I will allow some silence now. So if 
there were no insights you received. I do invite you, once this recording is posted, to, to access it again. And you could always pause it for as long as you need to. For now, we're going to move on to the next step. I want you to, either in your mind's eye or out loud, to repeat and complete after me. I trust I can handle it if. 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 I'm just taking a moment to observe any shifts in the experience of fear in your body, even any slight changes of sensation. And I invite you to bring your awareness back into the room and gently open your eyes when it feels comfortable to do so. And just reassuring that if there weren't any significant shifts, I uh, would invite you, you know, to come back and practice this. Because sometimes, um, I know for myself, it takes a full 10 minutes even to be still to get to the knowing. Um, so just to let you know, it doesn't mean you didn't do it right. Um, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you just means you needed a bit more time to get that wisdom. If you did notice um, anything, I just encourage you to write down anything that you learned about how or where you hold fear in your body so that you can start paying attention you know, to when it arises. How did it feel to bring attention to it? For some people, it feels soothing. For other people, it actually increases the intensity of that, of that feeling, which can be a bit overwhelming at first. Just what was that like? Was it difficult to be still and know? Maybe one was harder than the other. And were you able to identify a wise way to respond to your fears or worries? Or to identify what you're needing? Sometimes with fear, you know, we're just needing some, genuinely just maybe some extra safety or maybe it is calling us to be a little bit more cautious um, with our actions, you know, and our social distancing. Just take note of any reflections or insights. So, just for the sake of time, um, this is a list too of some other um, activities that can help us <laughs> get through these times. Um, we may not always want to spend time in meditation, which I can understand. Uh, I do highly, highly recommend it. Um, and for me, it would be my number one recommendation uh, just to get to know ourselves better and also just to, to learn how to be more present with ourselves so that we can be, I guess, more present in our lives. There's therapy, friendship, creative pursuits, um, exercise. I know there's a lot of people offering online 
fitness classes, exercise classes. I know Sarah's offering uh, free yoga for the rest of the week um, at the Healing Loft if you wanted to connect with that. And Sault Ste. Marie, or actually anywhere you are, you can still connect. Um, gardening was in this book. Um, I just added tending to your plants. <laughs> Since if you live in uh, Northern Ontario, gardening is not really an option right now unless you have a greenhouse. Uh, but I know every day I have lots of plants in my meditation room and I've been talking to them and telling them I love them and just feeling all of the, the life from them really because nature can be deeply grounding and connecting. Authentic conversation, you know, being able to just talk about whatever you're going through with somebody who you can just be yourself with um, and not have to wear a mask or pretend that everything's fine. Um, reading can be great. Um, there are two books. I think they're on the, yeah, they're on the next page of resources. Um, th this one, The Dance of Fear uh, by Harriet Lerner. That's one Anne-Marie recommends. And there is, uh, uh, sorry, You Are Awesome. Um, and Sarah highly recommends that one. And that does have uh, little solutions too in terms of how to work with fear and anxiety. And then listening to music. Uh, my favorite these days is Andra Day, uh, Rise Up, because it reminds me of the strength we all have within each other or within ourselves, and also, um, you know, the power that we have as a collective if we have hope and, and stay together. And so these are some additional resources. At the Healing Loft, we are offering 50% discount. Um, on all of our online meditations, just encourage you to make sure you enter the promo code, uh, save 50 before uh, checking out. And there's just a list of, you know, some of the ones that exist. Um, we have 21 of them. There's actually one, uh, I didn't put it on here, but I've been hearing a little bit about couples who might be struggling, spending so much time together lately. Um, so there is one that uh, I did uh, called Increasing Connection for Couples. Um, so if you're feeling a little tension, you might want to do that with your partner or your spouse. And all of these meditations were written and um, I guess recorded by either Anne-Marie, Sarah, or myself. On uh, Mental Health Foundations, that's where this video will be posted. And you can also find um, a variety of free online webinars that were recorded for parents, couples, and individuals. And some of those are Increasing Connection, Beautiful Boundaries, and Emotion Coaching. And then the books are listed below. And so I just want to sign off tonight. Um, First, in gratitude um, to all of you for joining. I hope that you know, there was something that you could get out of this webinar and just appreciate you taking your time uh, to spend with me virtually. <laughs> and so I will end with this. And you can choose, you know, if you want to put your hands on your hearts and close your eyes, or if you just want to take the words in. But may we all. Stay connected to our hearts and the inner wisdom within. Breathe into the pain of these uncertain times. Respond from a place of love for ourselves and each other. Trust in our ability to navigate the challenges. Feel hope rising. Stay connected to one another and feel a sense of togetherness. Be of service to others however we can. And may we all remember our humanity with grace and gratitude. I'm wishing you all health and wellness and balance. And thank you for joining me. <laughs>